Welcome. Today let's talk about general housekeeping in the ICU. Now in most complex patients there are many things that can go wrong and many things that you need to be aware of but if you keep to this mnemonic you'll at least have a general idea of how to care for the patient. Now the first F in fast hugs BID is feedings, analgesia, sedation, thromboembolic prophylaxis. Head of bed elevation, also prophylaxis, glucose levels, and then spontaneous breathing trials. Bowel care, indwelling catheter, de-escalation of antibiotics. All right, so let's get started. Fast. Jenny goes for feedings. Now you want to start feedings within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, unless, of course, it's a contraindication such as bowel surgery or a significant amount of ileus and so on. So feedings should generally be started within 24 to 48 hours. You don't have to reach goal, but you at least have to initiate feeds within 24 to 48 hours. Analgesia is important, and uh, that includes opioids and sedatives. use. Uh, they can continue, uh, use this as continuous IV infusions of fentanyl, for example, or you can even have scheduled, uh, PR, scheduled doses, pushes, along with PRN pushes. So that way you minimize the amount of sedation, especially in someone that you feel is either in renal failure or in hepatic failure that some of these analgesic agents may accumulate in the bloody, bloodstream. Next is sedation, and sedation would in, include propofol, uh, dexmethamidine or presidex and benzodiazepine. I mentioned benzodiazepines last is because uh, a lot of the evidence currently um, is seems to be in fav in uh, out of favor towards benzos just because of the risk of uh, increasing the length of stay in episodes of delirium and so on, especially in old, uh, older patients. So that's sedation. The next is thromboembolic prophylaxis. I'm going to try to uh, even not even spell that but that includes DVT prophylaxis. You can either use heparin subcute or low molecular weight heparin. You generally defer to heparin subcute, especially if the, um, especially if the renal function, the creatinine clearance is less than 30. The next is HUGS, H-U-G-S. This is the head of bed elevation. You would generally want to get it about 30 to 45 degrees. I've normally noticed that it starts off being at 30 to 45 degrees. However, as the patient gets turned and cared for and bathed and so on, or they, they have a bowel movement, they end up going back down at 10 to 20 uh, degrees. So extremely important to keep this up to avoid uh, ventilator-associated pneumonias in patients. The next is ulcer prophylaxis, and that includes um, in, uh, PPIs. And what you want to do is start them on a PPI or H2 intag uh, H2 um, uh, like renitidine and, and so on and that's to avoid uh, stress ulcer formations. Now you'll have most patients that are at risk are those on, uh, with respiratory failure, patients with neuro uh, neurological insults such as traumatic brain injuries, uh, intracranial hemorrhages, strokes and so on. Uh, severe sepsis patients and septic shock patients are also extremely prone to developing st uh, stress ulcers along with burn patients. But I do caution you though to discontinue the ulcer prophylaxis when any of these indication is, is complete because if you initiate it, chances are the next physician is not going to discontinue it. So it's important that we understand that if we do start it for a specific indication, you need to discontinue it after that indication is over. If not, then it gets added on to the patient's medication list and they never come off it. And as we have uh, discovered or have more studies related to PPIs and proton pump, or proton pump inhibitors, we find there's a lot more side effects that we weren't aware of. The next G is glucose levels, and you want to keep the glucose levels less than 180 generally. So it's not really a tight glucose control, but just less than 180 in most patients. And you try doing this, either you initiate um, insulin uh, per protocol uh, based on... Uh, uh, finger sticks or AccuCheck's or blood glucose levels um, in patients that are extremely out of control, for example, glucose levels that maintain above 200, 300, despite uh, being on what we call a sliding scale or insulin per protocol, you may want to start them on an insulin drip. The next is S, which is SBT or spontaneous breathing trials, also known as pressure support ventilation. If the patient has no contraindications to it, such as, uh, for example, a PEEP of more than 10 or F5 to above 50%, and they're not hemodynamically unstable, as in coming off vasopressors or, or requiring minimal vasopressors at that point, you may want to consider spontaneous breathing trials in these patients to get them off the ventilator sooner. Bowel care, or the B in BID, and I'm actually, that's 
one of my blind spots is bowel care. So just make sure that you keep keep up to uh, up to date on whether the patient has uh, daily bowel movements and whether it, it's um, you know well formed versus uh, versus watery. You want to make sure that that's uh, that's cared for because a lot of these patients are on um, opioids and and medications and that are bed bound, and they actually don't move a lot, so they end up having constipation. So if you ignore this initially. Um, the patient may develop then, you know, increased gastric residuals and you'll have to hold the feeds and kind of get down to this whole long drawn process of starting them on uh, metoclopramide or erythromycin and kind of chasing your own tail. So if you uh, keep an eye on bowel care earlier on, it'll, it'll pay in dividends later down, down the road. The next is indwelling catheters uh, and this includes uh, ET tubes, uh, this includes Foley catheters along with PICC lines or even central lines. And one thing that we try to we tend to ignore is A lines. A lines as well uh, should be considered just as significant as central lines. And these, uh, when the indication is over, you should remove them, and you have to be pretty strict about that because chances are, due to just natural inertia, no one wants to discontinue any of this just in case the patient needs it. Um, now the only only person you're serving in this is yourself um, because you just haven't done the right thing for for the patient. The next thing to do is de-escalate on antibiotics. That's what the D stands for. Uh, you should not have patients on empiric antibiotics therapy for more than three to five days. So once cultures are drawn, fall up on the cultures. If the patient's getting better uh, and you just have to kind of decide at that point whether the patient's at high risk for MRSA coverage or whether they still need to continue that or whether the broad spectrum coverage when you started that uh, initially was was justified. So yeah, so that's uh, that covers it. So fast hug. BID, just make sure you keep up with that. And uh, it's a great tool to use, especially to keep you straight in the ICU. Thank you.